Okay, so our keynote speaker, we've already uh, seen him in um, Wendy's presentation. His name is uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Robert Painter. He's a professor emeritus of anthropology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dr. Painter is an historical archaeologist, and his research concerns the impacts of race, class, gender, and the state on the creation of the modern world. His publications include a monograph on regional changes in the New England landscape, chapters, articles, and edited volumes on archaeological theory, the sociopolitics of archaeology, and studies of European and African American life in Western Massachusetts. He chaired the Department of Anthropology's Repatriation Committee for over a decade. He has conducted fieldwork in the village of Deerfield and the W.E.B. Du Bois Boyhood Home Site in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. So everyone, uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Painter. Thank you, and thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, boy, am I pleased to see how many people are still in this room. <laughs> That was a, a terrific uh, panel discussion by uh, Yolanda and uh, Christine and Wendy. And it's almost like we should have the drinks out at this point. I'm sorry, I, I just don't have them for you yet. I, I've got something for you later on, but I think I've got to I've got to do a build up before you'd appreciate the uh, you'd appreciate the gift that I'd be trying to pass along, right? And uh, so bear with me. Um, I am in search of my paper. Improvise. So okay, W. E. B. Du Bois. Right? This is what this this is what we're gonna talk about. And I'm gonna start off by thanking and congratulating the Student Association of Graduate Anthropologists here. Holy smokes, am I gonna take this idea back to UMass? I think this is a great idea that you all organize this conference, get a chance to talk to one another about the research that you're doing, get your professional feet kind of solidified a bit into, into the topic. It's really a good idea. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really grateful for being here. To say nothing about Patterson. For the undergrads, <laughs> something's happening in the, in the future. You'll, you'll do this someday. Just, just hang in there, and you'll appreciate the fact that you're getting extra credit for this. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to, uh, to thank Stephanie who I've been in contact with, trying to sort out the arrangements and what it is I'm supposed to talk about, especially how I shouldn't probably say the same thing that I said in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> and Becky Campbell. I'm, not sure I'm gonna meet yeah. Becky, but Becky also helped a lot with the arrangements, and thank you very much. And uh, Wendy, um, yeah, thank you indeed for getting me involved. So, what do we got? We got a session that has as its theme, a, a totally appropriate theme, that has something to do with pushing buttons. There we go. A totally terrific theme, this theme of um, knowledge and, what? <laughs> the theme for the session about the production of knowledge, about context, about uh, standpoint, and there was, what's the third one that I missed? It was in the title up there. Theory. Theory, 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 theory. theory. <laughs> and so it is so appropriate for Tom. It's so appropriate for Tom that that's the theme that we're, that we're, that we're using to celebrate him today. He's written so many books, articles, administrative reports, manifestos, and let's not forget that most important genre of academic communication, letters of recommendation, <laughs> that, that are in their own way very germane to the topic of knowledge production and, help me, Christine, and, and standpoint. Very good, you get an A. <laughs> yes, 
yes, yes, yes, yes, yes. yes. Here's some of the scholarship, some of Tom's scholarship arrayed all over my study floor. And Linda will tell you, my study floor usually doesn't look this neat. <laughs> He's written regional and global his culture histories that ask what happened in the past and how does it affect the present. You can see this in his books on Peru, the broad spatial and temporal sweep of his textbook and in his studies of the modern world, including most recently California's Inland Empire in From Acorns to Warehouses. He's also written about how we know about the past. The workbook has influenced the thinking of uncountable numbers of undergrads, and probably more deeply, that of grad students who had to teach it. He's always seen, and Wendy made this point, he's always seen that methods are totally entangled in theories especially in the ways that theory directs what questions need to be asked and therefore what tools need to be developed. And he is certainly the leading American archeologist and among the leading anthropologists who have reinvigorated the field with the rich scholarship of the Marxist tradition. All but Batten, this, this may seem odd, especially to the grad students at UCR. That was all but banished from anthropology when I started grad school in 1971. Standpoint has mattered to him. Look at the structural positions found in the Alternative Histories book with Schmidt and the inclusiveness of his history books. Look at the forging of feminist Marxist concerns in his papers and that he and Christine brought together in power and re power relations and state formation. And look at the range of characters that show up in his, in his histories. Look at the range of characters in acorns. And of course, there are histories of the field that are important, most notably his two books, Towards a Social History of Archaeology and a Social History of Anthropology, along with, again, being inclusive in who counts in these histories. He did us all a service by positioning the changes in archaeology and anthropology within the contexts of the changes in our anthropology-producing way of life. The reasons for changing schools of thought, in addition to logical arguments and empirical adequacy, have much to do, he argues, with the way anthropology resonates with the currents of our culture. And then there is one of my favorites, his little monthly review book, Inventing Western Civilization, a good lure to the unsuspecting undergraduate student to get them into the field and tonic for the graduate students and professors caught up in the logical twists and turns and the mounds of data required in our knowledge production. What's so good about this book, though, you find it throughout all his work, is that it helps one stay oriented on issues that matter. Tom's work is focused by this question. To what end do we produce knowledge? Certainly to increase our understanding of what happened in the past. Tom is not interested in today's standard of truthiness. And his work is also guided by the end of addressing matters of social justice in our world. And this work is also guided. Yeah, that's, we read that sentence. Tom has produced <laughs> scholarship while at the same time producing more just institutional context within which others can do the work of knowledge production. For instance, working on the minority report for the AAA, serving at the on the Temple Union, and now helping administer a fine public institution of higher education. His methods are linked to his theories, which are linked to his histories that help him understand what needs attention today. Let's take a look at two slides and show you what happens when people do this kind of work. This is the 1971 anthropology department at Brown University from a, the year in which I got my BA in anthropology at Brown. And usually, when I, often when I put this slide up, there are audible gasps. <laughs> from the gender makeup of it, huh? Yeah. 
The woman is Louise Lamphere, who in three years, three years later will be denied tenure because her groundbreaking work on gender was considered, quote, theoretically weak. Do I hear a dog whistle? Theoretically weak by some influential members of this department. And if you're familiar with her work, it's hard to under understand this assessment. But if you look at the social context, you begin to understand one of the ways structural discrimination works. Her class action lawsuit resulted in Brown aggressively changing its hiring practices. Lamphere was being retroactively granted tenure and other sex discrimination lawsuits being modeled on hers. After being denied tenure, Dr. Lamphere got a job at the University of New Mexico and went on to a distinguished career that included being elected president of the American Anthropological Association. Theoretically weak, right? Okay. Like all the other guys up there. Like all the other guys up there. <laughs> I appreciate the fact that Dietz looks like he's sucking on a lemon. <laughs> Uh, you can learn about her case. If this interests you, you can learn her about her case by Googling Louise Lamphere Brown and the, Brett Brown has put up a terrific website about the case. And you can get to read the, 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 the discriminatory comments concerning her research on gender that appear in letters that were submitted for her tenure case. Huh, it's the present faculty at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Yeah, it has more people. And note that it has 17 women and seven men. 71% of the faculty are women. 83% of the tenured faculty are women. And what you wouldn't know is that it has five indigenous people. You might guess correctly that it has two African-American people, and there's one Latino and one Latina. This is a very different social context. And you can believe that it produces different questions, different theories, and different methods. And how did this change come about? because people in the department and the administration were doing the kind of teaching, writing, and administrative work done by doctors Ashmore, Gailey, Moses, and Patterson that you've heard from today, who all see their research as addressing the injustices of our world, as well as gaining a better understanding of the causes of cultural difference in the past and in the present. So let me turn to another person who cared about the ends to which scholars do their research, W.E.B. Du Bois. I'll talk some about who he was, then present some of some straight ahead archaeology work that we've been doing at the W.E.B. Du Bois home site, and then discuss how we've developed the home site to help bring Du Bois to greater prominence in today's discussions about matters of social justice. Here, Here's a brief sketch of his 95 year long life. You better believe it's brief. William Edward Berghart, Berghart's his mother's family's name, that's the B in W-E-B. William Edward Berghart, Du Bois, was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts on February 23rd, 1868. Now pay attention to this, five years after the Emancipation Proclamation and three years after the end of the Civil War, he died on the eve of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. 95 years. What 95 years? What 95 years? So Great Barrington, where he was born, is here in the southwestern corner of Massachusetts, bordered by New York and Connecticut. Great Barrington, if my hand doesn't shake too much, is right there. Um, and here are two pictures of him. Ah, 
with mom. And as a youth, he is, whoops, well, when I moved ahead, he was clearly a loved child. He was clearly a loved child. At his high school graduation, he gave a speech on Wendell Phillips. And you know, you're not going to know who Wendell Phillips is, but he was, the, he, among the white abolitionists, he was one of the radical white ab It's going to abolition now, not tomorrow, now. Right? Du Bois, of course, is doing Wendell Phillips. <laughs> um, he went on to college at Fisk in Tennessee, graduating in three years. Uh, importantly, at Fisk, he encountered and was deeply moved by Southern African American culture and saw in the injustices of the Southern white version of Jim Crow. These both profoundly changed the life of this self-styled New Englander. From Fisk, he went to Harvard, where he got another BA. Uh, and stayed on to do graduate study in, at Harvard in history that included two years at the University of Berlin studying sociology with the likes of Max Weber. He finished his PhD at Harvard in 1896, the first awarded to an African American by Harvard. Its title is The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America 18, 1638, I'm going to say then 1865, right? I'm going to say till 1865, the end of the Civil War, 1870. Hmm. Better believe you need to read that to find out if slavery ended with the Civil War. Eh? It, that dissertation is the first volume in Harvard's history series, uh, quite a distinction. From uh, 1896 to 1897, he was an instructor of sociology at Penn in Philadelphia, working on a grant to conduct research about African American life in Philadelphia by living in, by living in the African American community and then writing The Philadelphia Negro, the first urban ethnography, which makes him a founding father of sociology and anthropology. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's like a primer on anthropological field methods, ethnographic field methods, because he ends up doing quantitative and qualitative studies. He expected the book to change white oppression once the white Philadelphia elite understood that racial discrimination was hurting everyone because of all the wasted lives and talents in the black community. See, he was still this intellectual kid who'd been brought up in New England, in the churches of New England, and he thought a good argument could change the world. And he figured out then pretty quick that you needed politics if you were going to do it wedded to a good, solid, empirical study. So, he gets a job at Atlanta University, and man, is that an academic's desk or what? <laughs> right? Where he oversaw the production of 24 volumes uh, of what are called the Atlanta Papers that were studies, empirical studies, of African American life in the South, including demography, education, religion, artisanship, and this was like brand new in the field of sociology. Sociology was just getting started. And here comes this guy who studies with Weber, and he, not Robert Park at Chicago, but W.E.B. Du Bois is instituting this scientific sociology at Atlanta. And he's running a field school. He didn't call it that, but we would today, where African-American graduate students in sociology would go to learn how to hone their chops. In 1903, he published his most famous book, The Souls of Black Folk, a collection of essays on American history, race, sociology, and his private life from an African-American man's perspective that res it really does resonate with readers today. 
You might have heard the most famous quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, and often it stops right there, but you gotta read on with Du Bois. The relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands of the sea. He had a global understanding of the racial divide when he wrote that book. He took a major step in integrating his scholarship and politics as a leader when he became the co-founder and general secretary of an outfit called the Niagara Movement, which was the immediate precursor to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, of which he was also a co-founder. He was also the director of publicity and research, and influentially, he was the the originator and the editor of a magazine called The Crisis, which is still today the NAACP's po uh, magazine that it distributes to its members. You know, you gotta think, it's, this is, what did I say, 1905, 1905, this is mass, this is the only mass marketed publication that af about African America that's gonna be read by so many African Americans. This isn't it, the editor is really influential. And he took his, he, he, um, And he also took his politics and scholarship global. Whoops, there he is at the NAACP in the office of the, of the crisis. He took his politics global um, by, by, being, by attending and co-convening and presenting at Pan-African Congresses throughout the early 20th century. These Congresses where Congresses were saying, you know, the, 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 Engl the Europeans have really colonized Africa, deep, the interior of Africa, just in the last generation or two. And we can kick them out. How are we going to kick them out? That's what the Pan-African Congresses were trying to figure out, which, of course, they succeeded in doing by the, by the 1950s and 1960s. In the middle of all of this activity, in 1928, when he's 60, He's given the house that was his boyhood house by his friends, his friends. His friends were in included the, 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 the political sage and great educator, Mary McLeod Bethune, and the radical, uh, pr the prominent progressive attorney, Clarence Darrow. So they purchased it for him and gave it to him for his 60th birthday, and he was, he was stunned. <laughs> he was stunned. In 1935, Du Bois published Black Reconstruction, uh, a radical reinterpretation of the causes of the Civil War, the significant role African Americans played in the Northern victory, the enormous gains made during the period of Reconstruction, and the betrayal of those projects after the 1878 election, and then the reinstitution of a vamped up version of slavery with Jim Crow. Uh, this book profoundly challenged the mainstream take that was dominated by the Southern historians who painted a very different picture, steeped in white supremacy in which the war was about states' rights, not slavery, and that Reconstruction was a period of corruption and incompetence, which is the story that I got when I was in high school. That's how long this stuff percolated in the culture. Rather than it being, rather than Reconstruction being, as he says in the quote, the finest effort to achieve democracy for the working millions, the working millions, not just the black people, the working millions which this world has ever seen. The book is well worth reading to learn American history, to see how to make a paradigmatic shifting argument and to see an example of how to meld class and race analyses together, to do intersection, intersectional work at that time. In 1950, he runs for the Senate from the, New York, from the Progressive Party in New York. He's 82. In 1951, during the McCarthy era, he's indicted, tried, and acquitted for subsur for of sub charges of subversive activities brought against him by the U.S. Justin <laughs> Justice Department for his work leading an anti-nuclear war committee. 
And here he is with Kwame Nkrumah and Mrs. Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah was the first president of the first liberated sub-Saharan Africa. And in 1960, Du Bois accepted President Nkrumah's invitation to move to Ghana and work on the Encyclopedia, not Britannica, the Encyclopedia Africana, for which he drew up a multi-year plan of work in his 92nd year. Really? He's, uh, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do this. He died at 11.40 p.m. August 27, 1963, just before the 250,000 person march for jobs and freedom. Before Dr. King spoke, Roy Wilkins, the executive secretary of the NAACP said, quote, at the dawn of the 20th century, his was the voice that was calling you here today. And everybody knew who he was. They didn't need the introduction that I just gave you all. And most of you, I, I, with no shame to you at all, shame to the institution and, and the depth of structural racism, you don't know him. And that's okay. We're going to change that. <laughs> How many of you were, yeah, you know, right? How would you know about him? How would you know that it was so important to anthropology's history if you didn't, especially if you didn't take classes from Yolanda and uh, Christine and Tom and Wendy. Tom knew about him. Tom uses Du Bois' magisterial black reconstruction to teach archaeologists about the 19th century social context of their ideas in one of his books. And in Inventing Western Civilization, he brings up one of Du Bois' most famous concepts, the double consciousness of many African descent people living in this racist society to help people understand some of that falseness of the promise of civilization that Yolanda talked to us about earlier. So, you know, it would also help if you encountered Du Bois when you learn American history, in American history books in high school, or when you're driving around America and you can stop and visit a historic place. And it's the Du Bois historic place, but there is no, or there is now, but there wasn't until very recently a place you could go where you would encounter this guy on the historical landscape. And that's what I want to ta talk about next, our work on that. So, yeah. Given this resume, it seems appropriate that there is a National Historic Landmark set aside to honor Du Bois in the town of his birth. He lived as a young child on the property. This is, you know, this is the house again, picture of the house. I hope that was clear when I put it up earlier. Yeah. Yeah, he, remembers, he remembers that. It's where he lived, it's not where he was born. You don't remember where you're born. You remember when you're like one or two or three. That's where you remember. This is what he remembers, right? And he lives there until he's like about five. And then he's given it as a birthday gift when he's 60. And it became a National Historic Landmark, which is the, the highest designation given to places on the National Historical Landscape. And up until about 2007, this is what it looked like. That's poison ivy. That's poison ivy. <laughs> and those are deer ticks oh. Oh, crawling around in there. <laughs> clearly, clearly there was a need for an archaeologist, not an architectural historian. <laughs> Here's a brief history of the site. <coughs> The area, was, the, the area was long in the homeland of the Mohican people. When white settlers first arrived in the mid-1700s, Du Bois's maternal great or great-grandfather, there's some genealogical debate, who was stolen from Africa, was brought to Great Barrington in bondage by one of the first white colonists of the region to do the labor of clearing the land. 
By 1820, and maybe as early as the 1790s, Du Bois's free descendants moved into a section of Great Barrington known as the Egremont Plain and built what Du Bois called the House of the Black Berghearts. Uh, if I look up and paint, point. The property stayed in the hands of the Berghearts. That's why you gotta follow the women. Stay in the prop, this property stayed in the hands of the Berghearts uh, until 1954, Du Bois being one of the Berghearts, when Du Bois sold it. Why did he sell it? Remember the 1950s for Du Bois, right? The run for the Senate, the federal indictment. He was in his 80s. The State Department was pulling his passport. That's another story I won't get into. He just didn't have the time and the money. So that's when the dilapidated, dilapidated house was torn down. When he left for Ghana shortly thereafter, he joined the Communist Party USA, 19, 1960. You know, you start putting that together and you, you, if you're communist in 1960, you're like, yeah. like this in the United States. And he joined it. One of the reasons that I heard is that he said, the communists stood by us, meaning black people, in the 30s, and he's talking about during periods of lynching when nobody else would. I'm going to stand by them now. Black people and white people, some black people, many white people, were quite happy to have Du Bois' house torn down and Du Bois be forgotten because of joining the Communist Party. But not two guys, Dr. Edmund Gordon, oops, we'll go on here, and, Do and Mr. Walter Wilson. Dr. Edmund Gordon went, went to be one of the founders of Head Start. And uh, Walter Wilson um, and he and, and Gordon got together and they were both admirers of Du Bois and they de decided they were gonna buy the Du Bois home site when they saw that it was on the, mar on the market. And Gordon and Wilson, once they did that, is they formed a memorial committee that included Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, William Gibson, and Norman Rockwell. And after D King's assassination, <coughs> excuse me, Wilson and Gordon and the, and the supporters in Great Barrington sought to dedicate the site as a memorial park to Du, du, to du Bois. There was a racist, anti-communist reaction by some in Great Barrington and Berks Berkshire County. 30 death threats were leveled against the dedication ceremony. The Great Barrington police brought in riot gear to quell the riots when things got out of hand. The FBI was on the scene, and the local newspaper declared, let the memorial committee have its day and leave the monument to those who will undoubtedly take out their wrath on it in the weeks to come. Yeah. Du Bois, there's, there's, there's the program for the dedication ceremony. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to catch this. Here we go. And, and, and it was over on a, on a splendid fall day. The dedication ceremony went off in fine and peaceful style, presided over by Ossie Davis as the MC and Julian Bond as the keynote speaker. And you can see a film, a part of this ceremony, if you wish, at the UMass Special Collections website. <coughs> The Du Bois Memorial Committee was able to keep up the property and even got it placed on the National, Historic, at, on the National Register and became a National Historic Landmark. But he, age and expenses got the better of the Du Bois Memorial Committee. And New England f old, uh, old forest succession set in and the home site became increasingly obscured and in 1987, 
The home site was given to the University of Massachusetts as a gift. And the next year, the Massachusetts economy went in the tank for a decade. And the university didn't have any money to do anything about the home site. And that's, so that's what it looked like until not so long ago. So how did I get involved? I'm a brand new assistant professor at UMass in 1981, and I get a visit from Skip Mead, the guy in the aqua shirt, the African-American guy in the aqua shirt, Skip Mead, who was a, who was a member of the, Af the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts. And the chair of that department, Ernie, er Ernie, Ernie, uh, come on, Bob. Sorry, Ernie Allen. And they asked me, do that. did I think I could do something with uh, archaeology to um, help with the project of upgrading the site? And here, here's my standpoint moment, or one of my standpoint moments in this talk, right? I'm sitting there going, Du Bois, Du Bois, Du Bois, Du Bois, Du Bois, and I got this little bell going off in the back of my head going, ding, 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 ding. But I, there's not much more than just this little bell ringing. And I say, yeah, 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 I'll tell you, uh, Bob. I'll get back to you on this. And I scurried across the campus to the bookstore, found, uh, edited Du Bois books. I'm on. I'm on. But what did this white boy growing up in the suburbs know about W.E.B. Du Bois? Why do we need diversity in our social context if we're going to produce good knowledge? Because we're, our society is riven by those kinds of divisions. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning because I'm not a black man. I'll always be learning. So. The home site today is what's outlined here in the red dotted marks that you shape. It's about five acres. The house in the middle, right here, is, is owned by, and it's not the Du Bois house, the house in the middle is owned by one of the people that was not happy with the dedication <laughs> ceremony. And the, 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 the the house foundation is in this area down here. Okay. We have four field, we've had four field schools. We, me, Whitney Battle Baptiste. We've had four field schools, um, archaeology field schools at the home site, 1983, 1984, 2003, and 2012. The goals of the archaeology were to get a sense of the resources by conducting an intensive survey. There we are doing archaeology. We wanted to know about the extent of the remains, both the horizontal extent and the depths of the remains. And we wanted to be able to estimate how many artifacts might yet be left in the ground. We wanted to know about the disturbance to the site, the integrity of the remains. I was worried about bottle hunters, and I was especially worried about vandalism, given what was said at that uh, dedication at, by the, in the newspaper. And in the course of doing these studies, we expected to get a better idea of the research potential at the site. So before setting a spade in the ground, we consulted the documentary and oral history descriptions of the site, including articles and, and book chapters by Du Bois. And here, is an important description from an article he wrote in the crisis uh, when he received the house as a gift. It's the first home that I remember. It was a delectable place, simple, square, and low, with a great room of the fireplace, the flagged kitchen half a step below, and the lower woodshed beyond. Steep, strong stairs led up to sleep, while without was a brook, a well, and a mighty elm. So we had Du Bois describing the property. We talked to the Great Barrington Historical Commission. We talked with, David, <coughs> with Du Bois's adopted son from his second marriage, Professor David Du Bois. 
and we especially worked with the Du Bois papers. His papers are curated at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. That's what you would find if you, if you Googled Du Bois papers at UMass Amherst. And the archaeologists, we were ecstatic because we found du blueprints. <coughs> and the blueprints, better yet, were drawn up for Du Bois's dream cottage. It's not the farmhouse that he remembered. It's got a music room and a library. It's got extra bedrooms for guests in the summer. So we've got a combination of what, what of the footprint of what would have been there, what was there before, plus what he wanted to have. We've got another, we've got the second floor here. While well, I should move this along. Um, After working with the documents, we came up with the first model, our first take, right? the first rough hypothesis of what we're going to find at the home site. And we were, we were you know, figuring, we knew we had the foundation for the house. Um, we had a, a report that there was a barn. We could see artifacts scattered on the ground down in this area. And we thought, oh, well, that's, that's from where the barn fell in. Here's a brook that he talked about. This is the well down here. There's where we thought the elm might be. And we knew that when the house was dilapidated, they pushed it to the back of the site. So we thought, OK, here's the remains of the house back here. That's what we went in with, doing all the documentary research before you do any of that expensive excavation stuff. When we did get to around to get into the field school, uh, we, of course, this model changed, just what we expected it would do. One of, our, one of the field school's first early projects was to do a walkover of the entire property, right? So we spaced students a bit apart and just walked over the entire property and said, do we see anything else other than the foundation and the middens that we were talking about that are all in this area? And the answer was no, with the exception of a 10-ton boulder but we knew about that because it had been brought in for the 1969 dedication ceremony. Um, we did geophysics, and we made a contour map. We did geophysics, which gives us a quick way to peer beneath the surface of the Earth and see if there's any disturbances that we might be interested in. Made maps of that, went out, tested what, the, what those, what you call them, we call them, we call them anomalies when we get those funny looking kind of numbers. And uh, sure enough, we found trash pits when we did that that were interesting. Um, the only anomalies that produced archeological artifacts and features worth further study were in the cellar hole area. Um, we did get some anomalies in what we expected to be the agricultural land. And sure enough, that, which is that area all beyond, and sure enough, we found plow zones. When you can dig, you can read stratigraphy, and you can tell when an area has been plowed, and you can tell when it's just been in natural, just natural growth, natural forest development. Um, the first year, we, we, we surface collected the midden, because I, I was worried about all the artifacts there being something that says to bottle hunters, come dig here. And we got over 30,000, we got around, well, so far this midden has produced 30,000 artifacts. Now, mind you, when I say an artifact, I don't mean 30,000 things this size or larger. I mean some that are the size of my little fingernail. And others get to be whole bottles or whole plates. And the overwhelming majority of these are artifacts we believe to be from the period when Du Bois's cousins lived there uh, in the late, from, from about 1900 to about 1917, when they suddenly abandoned the house and many of the belongings and moved to Springfield, Massachusetts, boy, would we like to know more about the, 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 that family, the Woosters. And we just, we haven't had a chance to follow up. The leads haven't developed, but that would be great. So after we analyzed the results from the 83 and 84 survey uh, field schools, oh, I didn't tell you this, in the, in the, in the midden, we found artifacts from virtually every aspect of daily life. And I would tell you that this ink well, this ink bottle, that contained the ink out of which the souls of black folk was, 
No, I'm not. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I've taught introductory anthropology. <laughs> Um, so we developed another model. Let's see if this is the new model. Yeah, here's the new model. After we did that work, right? And so what we're and so now what we're seeing is we're seeing a, we're, we're seeing an area that's being used uh, for for household reproduction. We're seeing an area with a barn with still this the midden scatter around it, and we're seeing agricultural fields where those plow zones were noted. Back out in here with the plow, we saw plow zones all the way down to here and all the way back and through here. And a nice little farmstead with a house, a barn, agricultural fields, and about five acres. And you can kind of make a go of it farming in New England with five acres in the 1800s. Tough, real tough, but kind of, you know, kind of pushing you can, possibility. And there seemed to be high integrity. Remember, that was one of the questions we had. Vandalism. No place on the site were there any signs of holes dug into the site other than by us. And we had many bottles, some whole. And we were pretty successful at cross-mending artifacts in the middens. Um, and so despite the calls for vandalism, it seems the poison ivy and deer ticks <laughs> did their job. But when we went back in 2003, we had two surprises. I wasn't really convinced about this barn thing. There was, a, there was a bit of a hump in the terrain and then a bit of a dip behind it. And I was thinking, OK, maybe there's a sill for a timber framed barn buried in there. And uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. So that was one thing that that we wanted to test. We wanted to check that out. And by golly, hmm, it was a surprise. Um, when we excavated into it in 2003, we found trash pits. We did not find a sill stain, which would be what the decayed wood would leave. We did not even find a sill. We found trash pits. And you're like, what, what? Why are the trash lining up here kind of question. And uh, one day, when it was clear at the home site and the field school's working away, and if I did anything like go over and ask anybody a question, I'd just be pestering them. I got a piece of paper that we had found in the Du Bois papers that we couldn't make any sense out of. It was a bunch of surveyors, <coughs> bearings and distances that created a shape that didn't look anything like this U-shaped home site. So I'd have been like, Pfft and just ignoring it. But me and one of the volunteers, I said, right, Andrew, let's just try this out. Let's take this, let's take these uh, bearings and distances and let's just, let's just guess. This, this is where that surveyor started. And let's walk them off. And this is what we got, right? Here's that map we've been looking at. Where th this map is a map of just this area right here. Here's the surveyor line going here, there's that hump in the ground. And there's the survey line, there's the property line, there's the property line running right down the, the hump. Well, of course it is. You take your trash to the back of your property and you bury it. It's the property line. Oh my gosh. They don't have a five acre farm, they've got a three tenths of an acre homestead. So the whole definition of extent, when we were talking horizontal extent, right, thought we had five acres. Well, we got five acres for the home site today, but it was much smaller then, which raises this question of, so like, how were they making a living? Yeah. And so into the, into the documents we go, and we find out that Du Bois's uncle is half a mile down the street on a seven to 11 acre farm with, on, better, on better land and he's being taxed for farm animals. So you start thinking about cooperative family labor. And then you've also got folks taking jobs in Great Barrington, a very racially segregated ba Great Barrington labor market 
where African American people are doing, are doing service work or farm labor, and that's it. But whatever they're making from those jobs, they're, they're donating, that, donating that back into. What Whitney and I begin to say, we start saying to ourselves, maybe we gotta be thinking about an African compound and cooperation happening over space. So that, we haven't, we haven't, put, we haven't really, we haven't had the time to figure that one all, all out. But that's where, we're, that's where we're thinking. So that was a big surprise. Um, yeah, I can't remember what the other surprise was, and I'm not going to bother to read. To look for it. I know I said there were two, but I'm going to do. I'll, I'll learn that later. Um, so look, the other piece that I said is once you talk, talked about extent and integrity, you also start getting ideas about research that you might do, and so some of the artifacts that we found provoked some of these kinds of research questions. These are toys that the Wooster kids played with. Right? They've got this, we got a marble that if you look at it, this, look at it this way, you can see this almost like a West African cosmogram. Right? And there are all kinds of different decorative marbles being made at that time that you could have bought for your kid. Why did they buy this one? Now, I, this is not a strong argument. This is a speculation. But this is what happens when you start trying to get out of white suburban shoes and into African-American shoes and say, what do I see? This is what Warren Perry, my friend, talks about seeing the world through African eyes, which the discipline of white historical archaeology is not very good at doing. So suddenly what seems like a leap from uh, the suburbs to Africa isn't such a great leap. Du Bois' great-grandmother, stolen out of Africa, taught all her kids a song in an African language. And she never reconciled herself to living in New England. Um, what do you do if the only kind of doll markets for your daughters are pink dolls? What's that mean for how you buy presents? What's that mean for the, what's that mean for the self-identity of those little boys and girls? We know that that kind of information got used in the Brown versus Board of Education lawsuit. Oh man, here's, here's this. If I had these objects here, you would, especially this one, if I had this smooth black stone here, if I had this smooth black stone here, you would reach out. It's about the size of my little finger. You just reach out. It's, a, it's one of these evocative, magical things. It's just that you look at it and you say, oh, that's a smooth black stone. No, it's a, it's a beaver. It's, a, it's, a, it's an otter. No, that's just a scratcher. No, give it to me. I, no, and you, the next thing you know, it's passing around. Everybody's doing something with it. Juvenile bear's tooth. Juvenile bear's tooth. No other part of the bear. <laughs> no adult bear teeth. What? What? And then this six-pointed button, bu button that has a six-pointed star on it. So these things all come out of a really disturbed context. And it's a, it's a builder's trench. They dug, out the, they dug out the cellar. They put the dirt over here. They put in a new cellar wall. They took the dirt and filled the back in to fill in the, the outside of the trench. It's a, disturbed, it's a disturbed context. But in Connecticut, nearby Connecticut, and in the American South, when you start finding things like this together, you start thinking you're looking at Minkisi bundles, where African people are t communicating with the world of the spirits to do work for, on their behalf. Now, do I have one? Not as solid as I would like it to, but maybe. Let's see. I've got this trench turned up way more foundation than one ever needed for anything that was put up at that house. And underneath the foundation, underneath these, these foundation stones, there's a pit. And in that pit, there is a piece of limestone 
a piece of rubber co a river cobble and a, and, and a brick. And they're like, boink, boink, boink. So, like I said, quest the, 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 the material itself begins to uh, raise questions that you want to try and address in the future. Um, why haven't I answered these questions? Professor Painter, why haven't you answered the questions? Because of these people. Because we were collaborating with people in Great Barrington. People from the university were collaborating with people from Great Barrington. The people from Great Barrington were saying, we don't want no more of this poison ivy hatch where you do your archaeology. We want a place that people can come and learn about Du Bois. So I started going from being an archaeologist that takes things apart to having to learn how to put things back together again and create, and create out at the home site, create out at the home site something that would speak to Du Bois. Uh, along with the crew that you just saw, we had just uh, important support from Professor David Du Bois, who was Du Bois's adopted son by his second wife, Shirley Graham Du Bois, and the Reverend Esther Dozier, pastor of the Great Barrington AME Zion Church, which Du Bois and his family were active in. They were both great friends of the project, died untimely deaths, and are sorely missed. The university <coughs> responded uh, to, the, to, the, to the pleas from the folks in Great Barrington by building a parking lot and clearing a short interpretive trail that led just to the boulder. Um, next, the university funded a charrette where, yeah, with the, where the noted planner and artist and landscape designer Michael Singer, Singer in his studio uh, organized it, and attendees included members of the Great Barrington Committee of the Great Bar the Great Bar members of the Great Barrington Committee, the Great Barrington former selectmen, African American history museum specialists, tourism people, archivists from the UMass Library, and the noted museum exhibit designer. Veronica Jackson, and we all sat around and chewed this over and came up with a plan for raising Du Bois's profile in Great Barrington, and I'm going to tell you a bit about this plan now. We all decided real quick that Du Bois was too big a person for five acres, and so, yes, we had plans for the home site, and I'll talk about them in a second. But we also mapped out a walking tour of Du Bois's Great Barrington, and we had a, uh, a, an intern uh, helping uh, doing that this summer, and she just had a great time. And then we came up with a multi-million dollar Du Bois Center that would be in downtown Great Barrington to tell the story and to continue to do Du Bois's work. Ambitious. <laughs> it is a work in progress. Uh, at the home site, remember what we had. <laughs> we had challenges. We had challenges, right? Because what people were saying about that first interpretive trail is, you only got us to here. We want to get from the parking lot to here. And then we had to figure out how to get them back without them cutting across here or getting hit on this road, which is a very busy road. So we had design challenges facing us. And um, we knew that we wanted to have a we we knew that we wanted to have interpretive panels. We had money for seven of them. We didn't know what they what they should look like, and that's where Veronica where Veronica Jackson comes in. Uh, Veronica immersed herself in the thousands of words of draft that, uh, text that David Glassberg, a professor in the history department, and I wrote. 
and the hundreds of photographs that are in the Du Bois papers. And Veronica also taught David and me how to Tom craft short sentences. <laughs> uh, that could communicate to the general public what, we, what we're, we're trying to get across. And I'm going to take you on a quick tour of the home site. Here we go. Um, at the first panel, the one by the parking lot, the only one that many people will read, <laughs> uh, we inform the visitor that before the Freedom Riders, before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks and Malcolm X, there was W.E.B. Du Bois. Rewriting US, African, and world history to include the contributions of Africa, participating in the founding of the NAACP and the UN, I didn't mention that earlier, promoting the decolonization of Africa, uh, contesting the injustices of Jim Crow America and teaching the country how to appreciate the African-American aesthetic that weaves through US literature, the visual arts and music. That's Du Bois, they need to know. Above Du Bois on the vertical panel is a quote about a theme that runs throughout Du Bois' thought and the interpretive trail, Dem here it is, Dem democracy, democracy, not Stalinist Russia, democracy is, yeah, come on, Bob, time it better. Thank you, is it up there on the, yep, thank you. Christine, I, what could I do without you? Yeah, democracy is a method of realizing the broadest measure of justice. Right. The second panel, can we get to the second panel? Yes. Uh, is, is, uh, is titled Tireless Explorer of Social Truths, featuring him in a vertical panel at his, ac featuring him in a vertical panel at his academic desk in Atlanta. <laughs> Uh, his quote challenges the visitor, steeped in mainstream American history, to ponder, would America have been America without her Negro people? Next page, please. The third panel is by the boulder. The vertical panel features Du Bois, is run for the U.S. Senate in New York in 1950, in 1950, and the horizontal panel is the story of Du Bois joining the Communist Party, being forgotten by some, but not by Wilson and Gordon, who wanted a park such as this for Du Bois. The fourth and fifth panels are the ones, one of our, uh, uh, the fourth and fifth panels are as one approaches the location of the house. Panel four tells the story of how Du Bois was given the house for his 60th birthday. The vertical panel is the picture of his first wife and James Weldon Johnson, his buddy who also had a summer place in Great Barrington, standing in front of the house. Panel five is a panel, oh, in the blueprint. Panel five is at the, at the, at the uh, home site, at the house itself, um, that marks the location of the parlor of the house of the Blackburg Hearts and invites the visitor to imagine being in, as Du Bois describes it, the great room of the fireplace. I read you that quote, quote earlier. So it's kind of a phenomenological moment. And it also tells them about the archaeology at the home site. Um, a site map directs them back. <laughs> On the way, it stops at a gallery that they haven't seen before, which is the first time that the peop that people run into Du Bois is the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And that's a picture of Du Bois at the Paris Exposition uh, in 1900, where he has showing, where he shows photographs of everyday African American life that are, con that are contrary to the caricatures that the United States is just sending around the world. Then he the visitor meets Du Bois one more time on the path to the parking lot. Here he is smiling in the midst of young people, reminding the visitor that, quote, there can be no perfect democracy curtailed by color, race, or poverty. A fitting ending for our intervention aimed at promoting social justice through the words 
of the most remarkable American who is certainly worthy of an honored place on the national historic landscape. So let me conclude, and I do really mean conclude with this. It'll take a little bit, but not too long. Du Bois wrote history to create a usable perspective on the injustices of our world. To truly be usable, it had to be factual, something so obvious but needing to be stated given the political discourse of our times. And he was very concerned with getting the facts right because so much was at stake. The power of Tom's work is that he too holds to the idea that useful pasts are factual and concerned with matters of justice. And I'd like to close with one of my favorite Tom facts. It's in Tom's book, The Inca Empire, The Formation and Disintegration of a Pre-Capitalist State, thank you for last night, published in 1991 when the world was in the grip of a fi financial crisis in the core and debt crises in the periphery. In discussing the gold and silver given to the Spanish con conquistadors to ransom an Incan emperor, Tom calculated that at the 1991 rate for gold and silver, the ransom was worth $83 million, an impressive sum, sum, and a straightforward analysis translating dollar value from the past into present day value. Archaeologists and historians do that sort of thing all the time. But in the footnote, which accompanies this number, Tom begins with a fair assumption. If one denies the legality of primitive accumulation and considers the ransom as a loan with a 10% interest rate compounded annually, the loan with interest would be worth 83 times 10 to the 25th dollars today, which of course dwarfs the debt owed by Peru to the World Bank and the IMF. <laughs> From this perspective, Peru is not a debtor nation, but it is owed considerable sums and reparations for the illegal seizure of its property all those many years ago. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> 500 years of history reframed and the future reimagined by carefully analyzing what is often presented as a neutral fact of the matter. That is what Tom can do and has done throughout his scholarly body of work. No wonder we are celebrating him today.